Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Internet Computer Developer Journey. My name is Jesse, and I'll still be your guide throughout the Developer Journey tutorial series. In today's episode 0.3, Developer Environment Setup, we'll be downloading and installing some of the tools and programs that we'll be using in our Developer Journey going forward. Some of these tools include a code editor such as Visual Studio Code, DFX, which is the Internet Computer Software Development Kit, which is going to be the core tool that we'll be using throughout our developer journey. And then we're also going to download a couple other supporting tools such as Git and Node.js. We'll also be creating a working directory that will be used throughout the rest of our developer journey series to keep all of our projects in one core location on our computer. So to get started, I've opened the corresponding tutorial page on the Internet Computer Developer documentation. As a reminder, you can find this developer journey series by going to the internetcomputer.org slash docs, then going to the tutorials tab. Today we are in the level zero pre-flight operations category, and we're going to be in 0 0.3 developer environment setup. So to get started setting up our developer environment, we're going to confirm that we have an internet connection. So if you're watching this video on YouTube and you're able to access these web pages in your web browser, chances are that you have a current internet connection. You can also check this internet connection by going to a search engine such as Google and doing a test search or using a internet connection website that will test the speed of your connection such as speedtest.net. If you are familiar with the command line already, you can also use the ping command in the command line to test your internet connection. Next, we're going to open one of those command line interfaces. So in the developer journey, I'm going to be using a Mac OS environment. I will include links in the description of this video for instructions for both Windows and Linux environments but the workflow that I will be displaying on screen throughout the entire developer journey is going to be on a Mac OS machine. Um, so for me, I'm going to go to the Mac OS launchpad. I'm going to type in terminal. And with that, I'm going to open a new terminal window that you're going to see on the screen here. And I'm just going to quickly rearrange my windows so that I can have the instructions for this episode on one hand of the screen and then my terminal window on the other um, side of the screen. And I'm also going to make this terminal window a little bit bigger so that we can see the commands in it a little bit clearer. So this is a command line interface, um, also referred to as the terminal or the shell, um, depending on the documentation that you take a look at. And this window is going to be the primary focal point of our developer journey. The majority of our workflows are going to involve this terminal window. So to get started, just to familiarize ourselves with the terminal, we're going to click on the terminal window and to take a look at what our current directory is, we're going to use the command PWD, which stands for print working directory. And it's going to return the full file path of where in our file system we are currently located at. And by default, most of the time, unless there are different settings on your local machine, it's going to open in what is known as your home directory, which is going to be a directory in the users folder. And it's going to be a subdirectory that is whatever your local user is named. So in this instance, this is just my first dot last name. Um, and so this is where I'm going to be doing the majority of our workflow from this point on. You can use any directory that you want in your file system. It doesn't have to be this. And you can change directories using the CD command. So if we wanted to change into the slash users command, we could just type CD and then forward slash users, paying attention to the capitalization that was used. And then um, if we run that PWD command again, we'll see it's been reflected that we've changed into that users command. So I'm going to go back into that users and then my home directory. 
So next, we're going to download and install the Internet Computer Software Development Kit, or the IC SDK. This contains a couple different tools that we'll be using in our developer journey, primarily DFX. So it is important to note that DFX is not natively supported on Windows, and in order to use DFX on a Windows environment, you will need to download and install Windows Subsystem for Linux. And we'll include a link to those instructions in the description of the video below for you. Um, then once you have that program, you'll be able to follow along um, and use the same workflows that we'll be displaying here. But if you are on Windows, you will need to download that tool first before moving forward. So to download the IC SDK in our terminal window, we're going to run this sh command. And what this does is it's going to fetch the package for the Internet Computer Software Development Kit from internetcomputer.org slash install.sh. And so that is an install script that is going to download and install um, all of the components of the IC SDK for us. And so to make it easy, you can click on the copy link here in the documentation, and then we can go over to our command line and click um, control V or command V, depending on your environment. And then we're going to hit enter and that will run some commands to download and install the IC SDK. It's going to confirm the installation with prompting us for our password. And then once we provide that password, it's going to let us know that it's been installed at this file path. And so this is um, the local binary uh, file path in our file system. And that's where our command line is going to look for our commands. So now if we type dfx and if we want to just check what the version is to confirm that it was downloaded correctly and that we've now got the latest version, we can use the command dfx with the flag, so hyphen hyphen version, and it should return that we are on dfx 0.15.1, which is the current version of dfx at the time of this video's recording. So as part of the IC SDK, we have DFX, which is the CLI tool that's used to interact with and develop canisters on the internet computer. Matoko is included in the installation of DFX, and so Matoko is the native language used to develop on the internet computer. We will primarily be using DFX in almost every tutorial in this developer journey, so it's very important that we have the latest version of it and that we get familiar with how to use it. In a future module in 0.6, we will do a full introduction to DFX and take a look at some of the base commands, the default project structure for projects created with DFX, um, and take a look at a lot of the other core pieces that we'll need to know in order to get started using DFX for our very first decentralized application. So since Matoko is also included in the installation of DFX, the IC SDK also includes Mach, which is the Matoko runtime compiler. And it also includes a version of the replica. So this is the internet computer's local network binary. This is what every node on the internet computer runs in order to be a part of the subnet and thus a part of the network. When we're going to be developing locally, we're going to be running a local version of that replica software in order to test our canisters functionality locally. So it's not going to initially be connected to the mainnet. We will, in different tutorials, deploy some of our canisters to the mainnet, but for local development, we're going to be using that local replica. Next, we're going to want to download and install a code editor. And so this is going to come down to personal preference. Um, if you have used a code editor in the past that you've liked, you can use that code editor again here. We do recommend using Visual Studio Code, however, since it does have a Motoko extension that provides additional tools for Motoko development in the Visual Studio application. However, you can also use basic editors such as VI or Nano if you are comfortable with using those um, inline editors, but we do recommend Visual Studio Code. If you want to download and install Visual Studio Code, you can click on this link that's embedded in the documentation here, and it will bring you to the download page and you can select the install for whatever your local machine is running. 
or like I said, you can choose any other code editor that you are comfortable with. So next we're going to download and install Git, which is the command line tool for GitHub. GitHub is a software repository website, and that is where the public Definity repositories are hosted. And so we're going to be using some of the public examples from that repository on GitHub. And in order to download that, we're going to use the Git tool to make it easy to download those example projects and then use them in the CLI. You can also download them from the web browser, but it is a much more complicated process. And since we're going to be using the command line for most of our other other workflows, it makes sense to use the Git tool. So in our command line interface here, we can download Git using a package manager. So a package manager is something that is included in Mac OS or Linux distribution systems that allows you to download software directly from the command line. On Mac OS, this is called Brew or Homebrew. And so if you haven't had that downloaded already, there will be instructions on how to download that in the description below. In the command line window, once you've installed Brew, you can type the command Brew then the word install, and then the name of the package that you want to install. So we'll be installing Git, and so we'll just use the command brew install git, and we'll hit enter, and it will go ahead and download the latest version of git for us. And then we'll be using that, like I said, to download some of the samples from the Definity examples repository. Lastly, we're going to be downloading and installing node.js. So node.js is used by DFX in order to generate front end code and its dependencies. It's not required for decentralized applications to contain a front end interface, but we will be doing some tutorials that include developing a front end interface. So since we'll be using it, it makes sense to download it now so that we don't have to backtrack and download it in a later tutorial. So to download it, we're going to use that same brew command or if you're using another operating system, you can use a, another package manager or you can download it directly from the website that is embedded in the documentation here. So this embedded node.js link and that will bring you to the download page for node.js. But since we're going to be focusing on command line workflows, we're going to use the command line version and use brew install and then node. In package managers, a lot of the times, this is just referred to as node, not node.js, but again, that will vary based on package manager that you're, you'll be using. Um, and as you can see, mine returns that node is already installed and up to date. That's because I have been using it recently. So of course I already have it downloaded, but yours will go through the download process to download the um, full node.js package and all of the dependencies that are required for it. So now we want to assure that all of our packages and tools are updated at the latest release versions. If you followed along with this guide and you've installed each of these tools for the first time, chances are that you're going to have the most recent release versions installed automatically. Since most package managers or install scripts like the install script for the IC SDK pull the latest release version. However, if you have some of these previously installed, for example, if you've previously used Git and you have Git already installed, so you skip that step, it is worth checking to see if there is an update available for you, just to make sure that we are using the latest version so we have all of the newest features and any bug fixes that have been applied since the last release. Lastly, we're going to create a working directory. So this is going to be a place for all of our projects to be kept in while we are going throughout the developer journey. We're going to be creating a lot of different examples, going through a lot of different individual workflows. And so it makes sense to keep them all in one central directory on our local environment so that we don't accidentally create subdirectories or we don't interfere with any other development that we may have going on. For example, if you have a separate project that you're working on, you don't want to get any of the examples from the developer journey series mixed in with that project since that may cause conflicts. So to keep everything separate, we're going to create a new directory that's just called developer underscore journey. And in order to do this, we're going to use the command mk dir, which stands for make directory. And this is a command that will work on Linux machines as well. So this will not be different if you are on a Linux based operating system. And so then we're just going to type in that developer 
underscore journey and hit enter and this won't return any output but we can confirm that this directory was created by using that cd or change directory command and then developer underscore journey and you can see that the beginning of our prompt changed from the tilde which is the shorthand for the home directory and you can see that now it reflects that developer journey and we can confirm that further by using that pwd command again or print working directory and we can see that now we are in the users um, then my first that last name and then that developer journey subdirectory and so this is where we're going to be creating all of our projects they're all going to be subdirectories of this developer journey directory and that is where we will pick up when we begin creating our very first decentralized application in a later episode. In the next episode, 0.4, Introduction to Canisters, we'll be taking a deeper dive into canisters. Now, in the previous two modules, 0.1 and 0.2, we did talk a lot about canisters, especially in 0.2. We talked a lot about canister terminology and some of the different terms and words that are used to describe different parts of a canister and how different architecture of canisters are structured, but we're going to take an even deeper dive in the next module 0.4, Introduction to Canisters, to make sure that we have a core and comprehensive understanding of all things canisters, since that's going to be at the very foundation of everything we build on the internet computer. So we'll see everyone next time. If you want to follow along with the documentation for this episode or any of the previous or upcoming episodes, be sure to check out the links in the description. If you have any feedback on this developer journey series, there will also be a link to the internet computer forum post for this series where you can leave us some comments or some questions. There'll also be links to our communities on X and Discord that you can chat with other developers in, or you can leave us a comment here on YouTube as well, giving us some thoughts or just wanting to connect with other developers. We'll see you next time. Take care.